All right. Hey, welcome to Discovery Church. Those of you who join us online, welcome. Those in our outdoor courtyard and our Northwest campus, man, so glad you're here. Come on, you're excited to be in God's house. Make some noise right now wherever you're at watching today. So excited you guys are here for this series. I'm so excited about you guys called Dream to Destiny. Dream to Destiny. And, 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 and I need you to know, God is giving every person, he gives everyone a dream. And every person has a destiny, both a dream and a destiny. If you haven't gotten your dream, if you don't know like what that is though, like God's vision for your life, you can. I'm going to help you do that. And that's one of my passions, honestly. And it's one of the reasons why we call Discovery Discovery Church is we help you discover not only who God is, but your purpose in Christ. And so there's, there's a dream and there's a destiny. Sad fact is though, a lot of people live with the dream and they're not fulfilling their destiny. They have ambitions and dreams and desires. They, they threw out their life and they've kind of laid them down little by little, little, and they're just not walking in the complete destiny that God has for their life. This series that we're in is going to take us all summer. <laughs> we're going to be doing a character Bible study on one of my favorite uh, uh, characters in the Bible, the life of Joseph. Joseph is an amazing character. It's, it covers in the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, 13 chapters from Genesis chapter 37, where he first kind of shows up on the scene in Scripture, all the way to Genesis chapter 50, where he is at the right hand of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and which is the most dominant you know, nation in the land at that time. So let me show you in Genesis chapter 37. How many y'all ready to study the Word of God? Are y'all ready to study the Word of God? Northwest, outdoor, online, y'all ready? I'm just making sure I'm in the right church. Y'all love the Word of God in this place, right? Okay, bring your Bibles, by the way, if you don't have a Bible, bring your Bibles to this series, bring some highlighters, your notes, because we're going to be digging into the Word of God, and today's topic is a little bit like, man, I, I got to get beyond some of the filters that, that, that we have to, to, for God to like reveal some truth to us. Genesis chapter 37, beginning verse 1 says, Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, in the land of Canaan. And this was the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph was a young man of 17 years old. He shows up just as this teenager. Let me skip to Genesis 41, not in your notes. It says, Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. That's 13 years later, you guys. So those of you that are students in here and teenagers, listen to me. God wants to speak to you, and he's got a dream for your life. Like he can speak to you right now, right where you're at, and give you a vision for the rest of your life. God gave him a dream at 17 years old, and he stepped into fulfilling it when he was 30 years old. Now, like he didn't fulfill his destiny when he was 30. He just started to step into. It was many years later he actually fulfilled his destiny, but he started to step into his destiny. Here's what I want you to see in this, you guys, in this gap, this 13-year journey from dream to destiny. The way you deal with the delays determine how you fulfill your destiny. These delays in our life can cause you to drift from your purpose, enthusiasm, and passion. They often wane in the waiting rooms of life. But here's what you need to know. Delays are not denials. God's not yet is not not ever. God sees what you can't see. Listen to me. And God's timing is always perfect. Can I get an amen, somebody? But in order to fill the destiny God has for him and for us, Joseph had to pass 10 tests. How many of you get excited about that? Ooh, a test. Any weird people like tests out there? Okay. I know that doesn't get you excited, like that, but there are. There are 10 character tests that we need to pass in order to fulfill the destiny God has for us. And the reason why so many people have a dream but have never stepped into the destiny is because they have not passed the test yet. See, the destiny will never be greater than your character. God has to do a work. So here's the, the first test. I got 10 of them for you, 10 character tests. Every week I'll give you one that we see in the life of Joseph, and we'll dig in and study it. But the first test is this, the pride test. The pride test. So, so if you're here today and you're like, oh, great. Well, I don't need this one. I'm so humble. This one. <laughs> You better perk up and listen, okay? Because it's a good sign that this is, this is for you, okay? Turn to your neighbor and say, this is for me. There you go. Turn to your other one and say, this one's for you. There you go. I knew that's why you didn't go there the first place, all right? So let's just get it out in the open. Okay, okay. 
So here we go. Genesis chapter 37, let's begin. Verse 1. This is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks of his brothers, with his brothers. The sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. Time out right there for just a moment. You might be unfamiliar with the Bible and, and wondering, like, what is it? I want you to know, right off the bat, God was never okay with polygamy, okay? He wasn't. The Bible is just very real in like not covering up the shortcomings of humanity. And really what it is, it's a testament that God uses imperfect, messed up people for his good. Amen. So you just need to know, like, and that's what we are. We're all imperfect. We're all a little bit messed up. And that's, a, so it wasn't like God, that's not part of God's plan. He just, he just a little imperfect. Okay. So here we go. It says, and he brought their father a bad report about his brothers. So he's a tattletale. That's what Joseph is. He's the youngest brother tattling on his older brothers. It's just painting a picture for you, okay? Now, Israel, that's another name for Jacob. That's his father's, another name for his father. Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons. Okay, so not only is it a tattletale, but now there's comparison going on, favoritism in the family, dysfunction happening here. Because, look, he had been born to him in his old age. And he made him an ornate robe uh, like with many colors. So there's, there's, he's getting gifts now and favoritism from his father. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word, couldn't even say anything nice to the kid. But Joseph had a dream. You're going to see this dream was from God. Look at this. And when he told his brothers, they hated him all the more. So here's what Joseph, he goes to his brothers. Mind you, these are his older brothers. They're bigger than him, okay? They're, they're, they outnumber him, and he goes to these older brothers that hate him, can never say anything good about him. And he's, he says this, listen to this dream I had, guys. You'll love it. We, we're all binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheep rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down. Isn't that cool, man? Y'all bow down to me. Y'all, y'all get excited about that dream? It pumps me up. I don't know. How, you know. So his, look what it says. His brother said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Like, are you, are you thinking you're going to rule over us just because Father loves you more? And they hated him all the more because of his dream. And not only because of that, because of what he said, the words that he said. See, just because you have a dream doesn't mean you share it immediately. You know, a lot of times, just when you have a dream, you got to marinate on that a little bit. you got to meditate on it before you go share it. Because not everybody can handle the dream that God has given you. And sometimes you can't even handle it, so you need to sit on that for a little bit. But then he has another dream. And he tells his brothers again, because the first time it went really well. Listen, guys, you'll love this one, okay? I had another dream. And this time, the sun and the moon... And the 11 stars, we had 11 brothers. The, 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 the 11 stars, they were all bowing down to me. And he told his father this as well. And his brothers, they're all there. And his father rebuked him and said, what's this whole sun and moon thing? You think your mom and I are going to even bow down and submit to you? Or are you actually, what are you thinking? Okay. And then he says, that, it says, his brothers were jealous of him. But his father kept this matter in mind, kind of like Mary when she was told about Jesus, where she pondered them in her heart. In my opinion here, this is the test Joseph failed. Joseph failed the pride test because God gives him a dream and then immediately he goes out and he boasts about it. And I say that Joseph failed the pride test, but I don't think we ever really fail a test with God. You know what I mean? I don't think so. I think God just, you never fail a test, you just... With God, you just take it over and over and over. God never puts an F on your paper. He just puts a retake, okay? You just retake it. So so listen to me. You can't move away from your problems. You can't can't go to find another church, okay, because your problem will follow you. You can't find another marriage because your problem is going to follow you. You can't find another city because your problem is going to follow you. Okay, so you can't run away or hide it or brush it under. You can't try to forget it. No, no, no. You got to pass this thing in order for you to fulfill the destiny God has for you. But one thing, more than anything else, will prevent you from your dream actually fulfilling it and becoming your destiny. It's pride. Pride in our heart. Look at Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18. Pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. 
Now, here's the challenge with pride, man. This is why we just need, I need to lean into this just a little bit because pride is so easily detectable in other people, right? You can smell it. You can see it from a mile away. You're like, man, you, you, you can see it, but it's so hard to discern in ourselves. We can pick it up in others, but in ourselves, it just is very difficult. So I want to share with you a few different types of pride because here in Joseph's life, we see one type of pride, and this is maybe a youthful, arrogant, boastful, naive kind of pride. And some of you are like, well, I can't connect with that. I, I'm not prideful like, like Joseph there. I'm not, that, that doesn't mean, but all pride will, will lead to destruction. Okay, so I want to show you some different kinds, some different situations and scenarios and circumstances where, where it's the same thing that's manifesting in our life that's causing destruction, that's causing us to fail the test, continue to retake and repeat patterns, and eventually not fulfill the destiny God has for us. Y'all ready for this? Y'all ready? Okay, three different types of pride that I want to show you, okay? It's, it's the Pharisee, the prodigal, and the King David type of pride. Let me explain it to you. Okay, here's the first one. The first one is the I'm better than you kind of pride. The I'm better than you. How, did this, how does this pride show itself? Because again, you recognize it in other people. It's hard to recognize in yourself. Here's how this pride shows itself. It shows itself in a critical attitude and a critical heart. If you criticize people and things all the time, and you're constantly, often criticizing, well, you know, look, look what they're doing. Look what she's doing. I go, Why is he doing it like that? Why is she doing it like that? Well, that's a reflection of a proud heart. If you're like, I know it's right, and you don't. You don't. I just know it's right. You don't know what's right. Another type of this, I'm better than you pride, is a spiritual type of pride, which is even uglier. That spiritual, I'm better than you, where it's like, we worship the right way. We have the right doctrine. We do it the right way. It's this nasty, ugly, pharisaical pride that projects like, I would never, can you believe what they did? I would never do that. Ooh, ooh, can you believe? And it's that, I'm telling you, that's pride. That's an I'm better than you, pharisaical kind of pride. This pride also shows up in marriages. It'll show up like this. It's, it's yeah, we have problems in our marriages, but I'll tell you, if I could just talk to you for five minutes, I'd have you convinced. She's wrong. Okay, 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 okay. 98% of the time, she's wrong. She's wrong. I'm just telling you. See, he, he's the problem. He's the problem. And it's this, this I'm better than you kind of pride that shows up in all these different fear, spheres of our life. It's dangerous. It's so dangerous. You can see it in this story Jesus told, a great illustration about this tax collector and a Pharisee. And the tax collectors in Jesus' time were very like crooked people. Luke chapter 18, he tells this story. He says, a Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. And that, what a, that's a terrible way to start a prayer, you guys. Just like, gosh, I thank you that there's a, I'm not like all these, these other people. You made me so good, God. You made me good. I'm not like these other robbers and evildoers and adulterers, or even like this dude sitting on the row with me. Look at him. Look at this is a tax collector over here. Man, God, thank you. Because I fast twice a week. Let me give you a list of things of how good I am, God. And I fast, and I go to church, and I give, and I, man, thank you, God. And then in, in verse 13, Jesus said this, this, this tax collector, he stood at a distance, and he wouldn't even look up to heaven. He beats his chest, and he says, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Now, Jesus, in this story, he goes on to say that the prayer that God heard was the tax collectors. He didn't even hear the prayer of the Pharisee. And, and, and so many Christians, when asked, do you get the moral of the story here? They go, absolutely, I, I do. And oh, thank God, I'm not like the Pharisee. You missed it completely. You have just jumped into the judgment seat and have become a Pharisee yourself. You see this so much in religiosity and in church, this spirit of religion, your self-righteous attitude, you judging other people's self-righteousness makes you self-righteous. Okay, that's not the moral of the story. The moral of the story is God, he, he was going to pull down the proud. He, he got to pull, opposes the proud, but oh, does he love to show grace to the humble. That's the moral of the story. I'm better than, it, it'll show up, okay? And then the second type of pride, if you're taking notes, write this one down. Man, this one can hit me at times, man. It's the, I can do it myself. I can handle it myself kind of pride. How do you know you struggle with this one? Well, you got a difficult time asking for help. 
okay? Uh, you're dealing with and I can handle it myself kind of pride. Or if you've ever thought or said, well, I just don't want to bother anybody. I just don't want to bother them you know, with it. I, 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 can, I can do it myself. If you find yourself with a very on-again, off-again prayer life, where it's kind of hot and cold, sometimes you're on, you're, you're praying really well, and then you just fall out of it, and you just stop praying for a while. What is that? Deep down, no matter what we say, what we believe, our actions indicate that we think we can do it without God. That's a pride. That's an I can handle it myself pride. I don't need to go to God for prayer. I don't need to put my petitions and requests. I'm good. For example, I used to struggle with this kind of pride. Those of you that can fix things like really well, you just got a knack for it, I hate you. You suck. No, I'm just kidding. I just, because I can't, my wife will say, dude, she's like, you can't fix anything. She's right, man. I'm not. I, one time, I actually bought one of those do-it-yourself-like things from the devil. Y'all ever bought one of those from the devil? Those build-it-yourself Ikea things or something? I don't know where we got it from, but it was from hell, y'all, okay? It was, it was a dresser, and, and those are the worst because they got the wheels and the racks, and you got to put it on right and put it in, and, and my wife knows. This is years ago. My wife knows <laughs> not good stuff. Man, I'm, I'm trying to put this, and she's like, honey, you want some help? And I'm like, excuse me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Back off. <laughs> Come back in 30 days. I got it. I'm going to have this done, okay? It's just, there's going to be like 10 pieces. I don't know what to do with either. Why are we like this, right? Why do we, why do we get, get this like, I can do it myself kind of thing? You know why? Because we're prideful. That's what it is. You see a great example of this in the story of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. Look at this. Jesus says, there was a man born who had two sons. And the younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. And you can read and hear between the lines here. He's basically saying, Dad, I want my stuff. Give me my stuff, Dad. I don't like your rules. You're cramping my style. I want to do life my way. And if it was a modern-day story, you can go read it. Probably say, like, he went and partied and drank and smoked and slept around and, and had a, had just, just wasted all of his, his money and his living. And before long, he couldn't support his lifestyle, and he started living on his friend's sofa. He got on his friend's nerves, so his friend, his friend kicked him out, and all of a sudden he woke up one day hurt, and he thought to himself, like, like, he thought he knew what he wanted. He thought he had enough to pull it off and all the resources to do it, but, but the bottom line is he thought he knew what was best, and he could handle it without his father. And Scripture says in verse 17, Jesus says, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I'll set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, but make me like one of your hired men. Can you see the contrast in the story here? From, from the, his proud heart to a, to a humble heart, pride comes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Can I tell you something? This is another reason why we have small groups at Discovery Church. This is like, and if you've ever said, oh, it's just like, I just work better by myself, you know. I, you know, I, I can handle it myself. I work better alone. You need to get rid of that pride because it's going to keep you from your destiny. You need to deal with the pride inside your heart. The first type of pride we're looking at is I'm better than you kind of pride. The second type is I can handle it myself. The third type is the, yeah, but that doesn't apply to me. Because even some of you over the first two were like, yeah, but that doesn't apply to me. Yep. So, so, yeah, yeah, I get it. Groups are for, they're for them. Pfft, not for me. Yeah, they're for like newer people, you know what I mean? They're for people that just like, you know, they, who need that kind of stuff. I, I don't need that, you know. I don't know. You better deal with that pride in your heart because it's going it, to, God's going to pull you down. Are you hearing me, you guys? Th those may be the rules for, you know, everybody else, but they don't apply to me. I remember I heard this story about Muhammad Ali who was like flying in an airplane and the flight attendant comes up to him because he doesn't want to buckle his seatbelt. She's going around telling everybody he doesn't want to buckle his seatbelt. She's like, excuse me, sir. It's time to, Captain said, seatbelt, buckle it up. It's a sign. Let's go. And he, he said, Superman don't need no seatbelt. And she said, Superman don't need no airplane either. Buckle up. <laughs> that doesn't apply to me. King David was like that in the Old Testament. Uh, at one time in his life, the scripture said, at a time when kings went off to war, King David didn't go off to war. It's what he normally did, but he didn't do it. 
And when he didn't go where he was supposed to go, he did something he wasn't supposed to do. Did you guys catch that? Okay. Okay, that's why you need to make sure that you're going to the right places and around the right faces, okay? Because he didn't go where he was supposed to go, and he started doing something he wasn't supposed to do. He saw something he wasn't supposed to see, thought something he wasn't supposed to think. He did something he wasn't supposed to do, all because he wasn't where he was supposed to be. He sent some people out, and he said, you see that naked lady over there bathing on top of that roof? She looks good. Go get her for me. Y'all know the story, Bathsheba. They go and take her, and the rules don't apply to me. He sleeps with her. She gets pregnant. He, he goes to the extreme to arrange this the murder of her husband, which Uriah was one of his men of valor, one of his friends, someone who knows David and fought alongside David. And he went to this extreme to have him murdered to cover up his, his sin. Because that doesn't apply to me. He got to this place where where it might apply to everybody else, but it doesn't apply to me until Nathan, this prophet, called King David out on this, and he told him a story. I think it's in your notes. I, I'll just tell you the story, though. You can read it. I'll basically summarize it. He says, he tells a story about this rich guy who owned a lot of land, a lot of cattle, a lot of sheep. And uh, there was this poor man who owned the, the uh, a piece of land and on the same property. But only he, he had this small lamb, and this lamb that he had, this poor man, he Nursed it like its own baby. It was like a, like a friend of the family, like a member of the family, you know. And there was this other traveler visiting, and he came through his land. And instead of this rich man offering one of his vast wealth of cattle or sheep to give to this visiting traveler, he goes to this poor man's house, rips that lamb out of his hands, kills it, cooks it, and serves it to the traveler. So Nathan's telling this to David, and the Bible says David's heart burned with anger, and he says, how dare he? He must, and he says, he must die. Whoever did this must die. That poor little lamb. Kill the lamb? Are you kidding me? Kill him. And then, and then, and then uh, Nathan tells him, Ata ish. Say, Ata ish. Now put it together. Ata ish. Okay, which means, they, he looks at him, he goes, you are the man, Ataish. You're the man in the story, David. It's, that's, that's you. You're the one I'm talking about. May I say very lovingly and humbly that there are some of you today that have pride in your heart, and the reason why you're not accomplishing your dream is not anybody else's fault, Ataish. Well, I'm better than them. I can do it better. I can do it better than her, Ataish. I can handle this myself. I don't need a group. I don't need help. Ataish. Why well, doesn't apply to me? Ataish, you are the man. Some of you ladies are like, well, thank God I'm a lady. Can I tell you, Ataisha? <laughs> Y'all know what that means, right? You're the woman. Is there an area in your life where you're saying, you know what? That doesn't apply to me. I'm, you know, I'm not happily married. I know God hates divorce. But that doesn't apply to me in my situation. I'm, I mean, there's, there's life after this. I mean, God, it doesn't apply to me. I know God says that I'm a steward of all the resources and the tenth belongs to him and I'm supposed to give it back, but blah, 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 I don't believe in all that. It doesn't apply to me. Ataish. You better deal with that pride that's in your heart and submit to God or else it'll keep you from fulfilling your destiny. Now, if you want to know why you're not fulfilling your destiny and other people are around you, you may need to pass the pride test. God gives Joseph a dream. And this is important to understand. The dream isn't the destiny, you guys. The dream, God just gives you the, the dream to get you started on, on, on this maturity path to grow up into your destiny. So we have to pass the pride test. It's the first test. It comes around, all back around in our life. Here are a few things that we need to start this series out with and deal with this first test. Number one is this. You need to understand, number one, God has a dream for you. He's got a dream. He has a vision for your life. You need to understand that. Joseph gets this dream, and understand this, please. The dream was from God. God gave him that dream of the sheaves bowing down and the sun and the moon and the stars and all that. That dream was from God, but Joseph boasting about it was not from God. Both dreams were from him, though. And God's dream for your life, you need to understand, is better than your dream. 
God's dream is better, and his destiny is bigger than your destiny. I promise you. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. God has a dream for your life. And I'm praying that in this series, as we deal with some things, the character things, that, that God would, would speak to you in vision and dream and insight. Some of you might not be sure of what that dream is. It's, it's actually why today's actually a great day. We have track two, Discover Your Purpose, is today at 3 p.m. If you have no clue or you don't have a clear idea of what your destiny is, the dream God has for you, we design a class called Discover Your Purpose. And it's today at 3 o'clock. You're invited if you haven't come to that class. You'll love it. It'll help. Discover, you'll discover some design things about you, about how God made you, and how might that you'd use that to fulfill your destiny. Now, here are time, a lot of times where people, they're like, yeah, but why doesn't God tell me, like, the details? Why does he have to be cryptic? Why does it have to be a vision of wheat, you know, bowing down and moon and stars and stuff, man? Just, just tell me, God, and I'd be able to run this race a lot clearer. Here's the reason. If God gave you every detail of your destiny, you wouldn't depend on him to fulfill it, and you know it. He, you wouldn't. You wouldn't need to walk by faith if he gave you all the details. No, he'll give you a dream. And the dream is intended to get you started on a journey to growing towards fulfilling your destiny. You need to get a dream for your life. You need to get a vision for your life. You need to catch God's vision for your life. Proverbs 9, 29 and 18 says, where there's no vision, when you don't have a vision for your life, that's when your life is out of control. And some of you may even feel like that right now. Like your life's out of control. And maybe you feel like you got your hands on the wheels every now and then. But because it's not the dream God has for you, it's not your purpose, it eventually goes off the rails again. And you wonder why? Why? Because you haven't grabbed the dream of God. You haven't grabbed the purpose of God for your life. A lot of times we're just chasing the wrong things. Because you may have a vision, but is it God's vision? You may have a dream, but is it the dream of God? How do you know if it's, if I got the right dream? And if it's, am I running my own race? Is this, is this God's will for me? Let me give you some insight here. Your destiny isn't a promotion or a pinnacle. It's not. Your destiny is serving God's purpose and God's people. Okay, Th this is so important to understand about God's dream for your life. It's not about a, a, a status. It's not about people bowing down to you and you finally getting yours and you taking that position and, and you showing them and you having the status or having, that's not what it's about. The dream God has for you is to glorify him. It's to glorify God, his purpose, and to serve his people. Now, if you have a dream that does not glorify God or does not edify his people, you got the wrong dream. And here's what, here's, here's what you need. A lot of times we have, we have the dream from God. You're just not interpreting it the right way. You're, you're interpreting it through the character, through, through your perspective. See, so God gives Joseph a dream of these. Uh, and it's from God, but he sees it and he says, they're going to bow down. Woo, that's going to be fun. Finally, finally they'll see how great I am. So, okay, so you have the right dream, but I'm praying in this series that as God actually shows some things, some character things in your life, that you'd actually interpret the dream the right way. Because it's not maybe what you think it is. And if the end result of your dream does not glorify God and edify his people, you need to go back and, on your face and marinate on that a little bit more. Meditate on that a little bit more. Get the right interpretation of the dream God has for you. Exodus chapter 33 tells us that the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a what friend jesus said this jesus said i no longer call you servants i call you my friends okay in, in the old testament here this this scripture is taken from the old testament in exodus when you see the angel of the lord or or god show up in like a physical form or a person form or an angelic form those are called christophanies that's a theological term for that Literally what that is, is Jesus, the pre-incarnate Jesus. 
Jesus, before he was ever born, through Mary, the Virgin Mary in the New Testament, he has always existed. He is the eternal son. Before all things and through him, all things were created. In the Old Testament, when we see the physical manifestation of the angel of God or God himself, it is Christ pre-incarnate showing up. This here was Jesus showing up to Moses face to face as a friend. Here's what you need. If you don't know the dream of God for your life, you need to get close to Jesus. That's what you need. What you need is, is, is to draw close, to know him like you would a friend. Psalm 103 tells us this secret about Moses and God and his relationship with him. It says that God revealed his character to Moses, but his deeds to the people of Israel. You see the difference there between what, see, some translations say his acts to the people of Israel. Some people can be familiar with the deeds of God, the acts of God, but not know the character or the heart of God. So you get familiar with God. You can be familiar with church. You can be familiar with the Bible. You can be familiar with the music. You are my champion. Giants fall when that's my jam and you stand undefeated. Every battle you've won. You know that you know it, man. But when you when have you actually let him stand up in your life and defeat your enemies? When when has he gone before you? What story can you tell of God rising up, defeating your enemies? And you say, Look at the goodness of God in my life. You know the song, but do you know the God? See, this is what this is this is. What Moses shows us, and this is just, we have this opportunity in Christ that we can have this relationship as a friend, not just Lord and Savior, but a friend that I can actually commune with God and get to know my God. I can not just get to know his deeds and his acts, I can know his heart. I can know his character. God has a dream for you, and what we need to do is draw close. Here's the second thing, because there's, there's a dream he has for you, but number two, don't brag about it. Don't brag about the dream. The dream leads you to God's destiny. Listen, but if you brag about it, you're never going to get there. You're not going to do it. I've heard people tell me, Pastor, let me tell you about the calling on my life. God's got a calling. Can I tell you? And I'm like, no. You just, no, you don't need to tell. What you need to do is just be faithful in all of God's house. That's what you need to do. Amen. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 5 says, Moses was faithful as a servant in all what? God's house house yeah he was a you know, tell me the stories of how many things you've done over there and you built that and you're part of this you're part of that but you ain't been faithful in god's house and you ain't gonna fulfill god's destiny are you hearing me you guys y'all being quiet today real quiet today you just need to be faithful to god that's all as you are faithful to god god is faithful to fulfill his promises and yet we brag can we just brag we brag we brag we talk about our accomplishments and his brothers hated him and for his dreams and his words and him bragging about it. This is the pride test. Look at this scripture. Luke 14, 11. For all those who exalt themselves, God will bring you low. God will humble you. That's what that means. If you exalt yourself, God will lower you. He'll pull the rug out from under you. And those who lower themselves, humble themselves, God will exalt you. Now, for all, some of us to stop bragging, listen to me, because some of you are like, man, I do that, man. I talk a lot, and I'll talk, and I'll, and I'll brag, and I can do that, man. So, so I'm going to help you out. For some of you to, to, to stop bragging, listen, you have to stop talking. Because you fill up the space. You want to know why we brag? Because pride's in your heart. Matthew 12, 34, Jesus said, your words show what is in your heart? Here's what some people say. They say, well, you don't know what's in my heart. Well, I'm getting a pretty good idea. Listen, what's coming out of your mouth. You don't know what's in my heart. Now, I get it. I don't know everything that's in your heart, but, but gee, the word is very clear. I'm getting a good idea of some things that are in there by the diarrhea that's coming. No, I'm sorry. By, by the vomit, <laughs> by, the, by the stuff coming out of your mouth, it's a pretty good idea of what's in your, your heart here. You know why? Listen to me. Pride always has a voice. Pride always has a voice. Pride always wants to give its opinion. Pride always wants to be heard. Pride always, listen to this, pride always interrupts people. Come on, are you as quiet over there in Northwest? Is this, is this? 
Yeah, like, like that's pride. Uh, the reason why we interrupt, like, like someone is talking, and they're in their sentence. Before they, ever, before they even end their sentence, you're jumping in, and you want to say something real quick. Let me get, ah, can I just tell you my thought? Let me show you my thought now, my thought now. Why do we do that? Because pride's in your heart? Let me just say bluntly, because you're a prideful person. Because we have pride, and we need to deal with it. That's why, because pride wants to be heard. Pride wants their opinion and their thoughts to be heard. Pride speaks more than it listens. That's pride. We have to deal with it, or we will never fulfill God's destiny in our life. God gives Joseph a dream, and he can't handle it. He's got to brag about it. Let me tell you something. If you can't handle the dream, then, then you can't handle the destiny. If you can't be humble with the dream, then you're never going to have the destiny because the destiny will destroy you. So God gives you a dream, and then he starts you on this journey to get some stuff out of you so he can make you ready to handle the dream. God works in you before he works through you. So if we're going to move from dream to destiny, we need to believe that God has a dream for us. And then when you get the dream, you don't brag about that dream. You don't boast about the dream. You meditate you marinate on it. You don't boast about the calling or the dream that God has for you. And then number three, we have to deal with the root of pride. We have to pass the pride test. And to do that, we need to deal with the root before we go on to that. We got to deal with the root. Okay, let me ask you a question. How many of you at some time in your life have dealt with pride? Where are you at? Come on. Where are you at? Have you, have you, when, have you dealt with pride any time in your life? Yeah, okay. All of you that didn't raise your hand, it's because you have pride right now. You're dealing with it. That's just. <laughs> How many of you have dealt with it more than once? Come on, where are you at? Okay. Yes. Yes, we do. We deal with it over and over. You know why? There's a couple reasons. One of them, many of us deal with the fruit, but we never deal with the root. Many of us see pride and we say, oh, no, I've made some prideful statements. I, I, I'm talking too much. I, maybe I just need to shut my mouth. Well, that's, no, that's the fruit. You don't deal with the root. See, pride is the fruit, but insecurity is the root. Let me say it like this. Pride is in your spirit because insecurity is in your soul. If you ever see a prideful person, you see an insecure person. Here's another reason we have to continue to deal with pride. Because at every new level of responsibility, every promotion, every, every new level, there's, there's a new pride and, and new insecurities that come with it. In other words, we're like doing great, we're doing fine, we're walking with God, everything's going great, then all of a sudden we get a promotion at work, we get a new position, we get a new leadership assignment, we get a new ministry position, whatever, and all of a sudden we think one of two thoughts that have the same prideful root fruit, one of two thoughts, I deserve this, finally, I'm the man. That's one. Or the other thought is, I can't do this, but I can't let them know I can't do this they only knew. Listen, both of those thoughts produce the same fruit. I can't do this is going to produce a fruit where you project things that you think that you're not. You'll put on masks and you'll overcompensate and your fruit will be pride, but your root is insecurity. And so we think, well, what we got to do, we fall into the trap of, I just need to be more confident. That's what I need to do. I need to work on my confidence. I need to be more confident in my abilities. I need to be able to communicate better and more confidently and more sure of, my, of myself. And that's the wrong, that is not, you don't need more self-confidence. You need to be God-confident. You need to be confident of who He is, that He has called you, that He will not leave you, that He will not forsake you, that if He called you to it, then He'll see you through it. It's a God-confidence that you need, not a self-confidence. So where there's insecurity in our heart, we have to deal with it. You remember when Satan tempted Jesus in the wilderness, Matthew chapter 4, Satan begins with this to Jesus. He says, if you are the Son of God, here's what I want you to know. You, know, you don't see this. Jesus didn't say, didn't say, I am to the Son of God. No, you're not. Yes, I am. No, you're not. Yes, I am. They didn't go through that, did they? It wasn't, they didn't do that. You know why? Because Jesus knew who he was. He knew. He knew. Instead, Jesus sets a beautiful example of security. He rested on the simple truths. It is written. His Father's words. Listen, this is how we deal with insecurity. We have to come to a place that we know we are children of God. 
I am a child of God, not by works of righteousness that we are to boast, but by his grace, he has saved us. And I rest in that. I rest in, in not, not the work that I have done, but the completed work Jesus has done. I rest in his work. I rest in his word. That's where my confidence comes from. God has a dream for you, and I desperately, desperately want you to catch it. Some of you have got a glimpse of it, but you don't know how to interpret it yet. And there's some things that need to be worked out for you to interpret it right. And in this series, I'm praying and believing over these next few months together, studying God's word and allowing the Holy Spirit to do surgery, clarify and reveal himself to us, that that, that dream would become, would become more clear. The clouds would, would lift inside of you. You need a dream for your life. And not just one that's concocted out of your own desires, but a dream from God. And when you get it, and you will, don't brag about it. Just be faithful. Allow God to work what he wants out in your life, because God has to work in you before he works through you. Many of us want God to work through us. We want God to do something amazing. We want we want to see God move in our life and see great things or spectacular things. And, and God's going, you can't handle that yet. You can't. You can't. Just let me work in you first. And, and if we want to turn our dream into a destiny, then we got to deal with that root of pride, not just the fruit of pride. And here's how we need to do it today. What we need to do is we got to draw close. we got to get close to Him. we got to draw in. and Because who, who you are spending the most time with is actually what you're dreaming about. You know what's influencing your dreams the most? It's whoever you're spending the most time. Whoever you are spending the most time with is influencing your dreams the most. Whoever you're giving yourself more to is influencing the dreams that you have. So some of your dreams, they're influenced a lot by media, by comparison, by your family, by your work. That may be why you have a dream of one day being at a certain level in your career, in your field, or the reason why is because that's what you have beheld and put before you. You beheld it and beheld it and beheld it, and you're manifesting dreams from what you are imagining. You're putting it in front of you, and you're, you're getting a dream, but it ain't from God. It, it's a dream from, you're getting it from somewhere. There's a spirit behind that, that workplace. There's a spirit behind that, that you're getting it from somewhere, but it ain't from God. If you want this dream from God, you got to get in his presence. you got to draw close to him. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.